Tennessee Titans quarterback Malik Willis hopes that this season is better than his rookie season. So what is his approach? He says, I'm just focusing on what I can control. I love that approach. And I think it's important to have that same approach in our own lives. We control what we can control. But what can we control? Let's unpack it. This is the Unpacking It podcast, where we relate big sports stories to life and biblical truths. Our mission is to challenge, encourage, and inspire you to follow Jesus and become more like him with sports conversations that truly matter. That's what I'm talking about! Coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey, I just want to thank you guys one last time for being here. It's the best day ever. Here is the president of Unpacking It Ministries, Bryce Johnson. Welcome to the Unpacking It podcast, where we unpack parallels, metaphors, and topics in sports that relate to life and faith. I'm Bryce Johnson with Luke Heaton. On today's episode, we are unpacking some QB battles and this concept of controlling what we can control. A quarterback has to have that mindset, and, and we can too especially as followers of Jesus. And so what does that look like in our own lives? We'll unpack all of that today. Uh, thanks to everybody watching on social media. So Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, also on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. And, and if you're on uh, Apple or Spotify, uh, be sure to, to follow, subscribe, share, rate, review. We appreciate all of the support there. You can always email me, Bryce at unpackingit.com. Uh, here on this podcast, you know, we unpack sports stories related to life and faith, and we encourage you to also check out our devotional that goes out through email Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We do the same thing. It's in written form, and you can get that in your email inbox for free. Uh, just subscribe on our website, unpackingit.com slash subscribe. We are brought to you by Sugar Creek Coffee. Deliciousness. SugarCreekCoffee.com. When you go there, use the promo code UNPACK. You'll save some money. We always encourage you to, to order two bags at once because uh, it just makes more sense from a shipping standpoint. And at Sugar Creek Coffee Roasters, they specialize in handcrafted, small batch, artisan roasted coffee. And so they don't roast until you actually place an order. So you can be assured the freshest roasted coffee is delivered to your door. Luke just got a fresh batch recently. I did a week or two ago and uh, loving it. Always a great way to start the morning. So enjoy some coffee. Think of unpacking it. Support unpacking it. Go to sugarcreekcoffee.com. Use the promo code UNPACK. All right. So it's the end of June. We're, we're in sort of the, the, the dark days of, of the sports world. The NBA draft took place last week. Uh, that was fun. Enjoyed that. Uh, we'll, we'll get some baseball going on this time of year. NBA free agency is always fun, but here at Unpacking It, we're always keeping an eye out for the football season. It, it's coming. Training camp will be here soon, uh, the end of July. And also fantasy football is, is right around the corner. And so we encourage you to check out fantasyfootballfellowship.com. Be a part of what we're doing. You can start a fantasy football fellowship league at your church. You can bring Fantasy Football Fellowship to your current league, or you can join one of the Unpacking It leagues where we'll be doing Fantasy Football Fellowship together uh, this fall. And so all three of those are, are options for you. Find out more details, fantasyfootballfellowship.com. You can email me, Bryce, at unpackingit.com. But Luke, good to see you. Let's talk a little football today, and, and I want to talk QB battles and and number of things one there will be QB battles across the league as far as who's going to be the starter this season but there will also be QB battles for the backup roles and you know you look at the the draft from from April in the NFL lots of rookies are now in the mix how many of them will be starters will they be week one starters will they be starters later in the season are they more you know equipped to be a backup ride it out this season and then maybe get an opportunity you know down the line so a lot to look out for is there a QB battle that you're most intrigued by? Yeah, one comes to mind just because it's peculiar and it's who is going to be the starting quarterback in Tampa Bay. Mm. Baker Mayfield 
or Kyle Trask? Kyle Trask, talented guy from Florida. Baker, I mean, obviously we 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 all know what I mean. His wild roller coaster of a career so far. I totally forgot he was even in Tampa after his short stint with the Rams last season. But that'll be interesting. I, I'm not even sure what to what to think of Baker Mayfield anymore. So that one comes to mind. And then I think really Houston's quarterback battle with Andy Dalton's there. I think no, uh, Andy's with me in Carolina, baby. Why did I think they got he was Davis in Houston? Davis Mills and C.J. Stroud in Houston. Huh? I don't. For some reason, I thought they brought Dalton in to be some veteran presence. You, but you're you right. No, keep, you got to keep better tabs on on the redheads. I, uh, very fair. That, that, that's uh, Doc my, minus one point for me there. You, that's a it's, tough a, look. it's apparent you didn't read uh, Redheaded Monthly, your, your uh, <laughs> periodical that comes in the mail. That's you're right. You Man, haven't slipping. got a magazine in the mail in a while. But Houston, yeah, Mills and 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 Stroud. I mean, Mills was progressing last year. I mean, he's, he's not been bad, but obviously Stroud is likely the future. So how early they insert Stroud into giving, giving him the keys of the franchise we should see, but yeah, Baker versus Trask is interesting in Tampa as a Tampa fan. You got to feel it's just impending doom around the corner. Well, Of course the drop off from Brady and yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tough spot for them. Uh, you know, with the Colts, they draft Anthony Richardson early. And so, yeah, I think people expect top 10 quarterbacks to start right away. Will Richardson be ready? And eh, they kind of drafted him knowing that he was raw. So does that mean Gardner Minshew is the guy? And I, I've been wanting to see more of Minshew mania. Yeah. We only saw like a glimpse of it last year. It wasn't great in Philly, surprisingly. Uh, but that's a, that's a that was a tough spot to be thrown into because Hertz was playing so well. So the expectation was really high. So you're not a Sam Ellinger uh, guy. He's done. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. I love Minshew. So it'd be fun to see him it, it, with the commanders. You got Sam Howell, Jacoby Brissett with new England. You've got Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi. I like Zappi. That'll Zappy be interesting. Fun. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Because yeah. when, when Jones got benched last year, that was, that was kind of a big deal. That's right. It really was. And so the other one that we'll, we'll focus more on today for, for our parallel purposes here for our, our conversation today, but Malik Willis, the situation in Tennessee, so, of course, Tannehill's been there, been the veteran, not really the guy that's going to get them over the hump. I don't, I don't think anybody believes that. And I think a couple of years ago when they were the number one seed in the AFC, they lose in the playoffs. He wasn't able to make the key play that he needed to down the stretch. Oh, so brutal. Tannehill, his time is, is running out in Tennessee. And so in 2022, they draft Malik Willis. 2023, they draft Will Levis. Who's going to be the guy in Tennessee? And, and what will this path look like or, or what is the, you know, kind of the plan for the, the coaches? And so for Malik Willis, it was a rough season last year. He, he did get some opportunity, didn't shine in that opportunity, unfortunately. But I saw this is what he said when, you know, kind of talking this offseason. He says, I am just focusing on what I can control. I have just been trying to take it one play at a time and one day at a time. And that's just my main focus. Understanding each play is not going to be great but make the best of what you can and learn from it what you can. And I know it's sort of cliche, control what you can control, but when, when a player really grasps this and understands this, especially in Malik's situation, I think this helps him out big time. Because what could he do? The alternative is dwell on last year mm -hmm. and be discouraged. Like, I can't believe I blew it last year. You could be you know, upset that they drafted Will Levis. It's like, oh man, are you kidding me? Or you could be worried about your future and, and, you know, allowing, oh man, you know, you're worried about every mistake and all that kind of thing. But he's saying, you know, what? I'm just going to control what I can control. And, and, and so what does that mean? When you get the opportunity, you, you play the best you can. You keep working on your game. You, you, you come early, you stay late, you work with your wide receivers, you work with your coaches, you try to watch more game film. That's what he can control. He can't control how the team views each of those three quarterbacks. He couldn't control that they drafted Will Levis. He couldn't control, uh, you know, a lot of a number of factors, how receivers catch the ball, all that kind yeah. of thing. But he can control what he could control. And that's what he's got to focus on. So I like it. Good yeah. For him. On the flip side, this, those comments also apply to, I mean, what Tannehill's got to be thinking. Cause when he kind of got blasted for his reaction and comments, I mean, some of it was unfair on how he was, his mentality when they drafted Malik Willis and how he said, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be a mentor to him essentially, uh, which it's neither here nor there, but you go from, I mean, the Titans were top three team in the NFL. Tannehill's leading the charge. 
and then two drafts in a row, you draft a quarterback somewhat early. From his perspective is, I can only control what I can control because the franchise drafting my replacements two years in a row now, and I'm still the guy, and I've got to continue operating like I'm the guy, but I can't necessarily control what the franchise does. So for Tannehill, he's got to, hopefully he buys into what Malik Willis is thinking, or it's going to be a nerve wracking season for him constantly looking over his shoulder. Absolutely. And I think this mentality plays out when certain players are in contract negotiations and when they're, when they're willing to let their agent take care of it and all right, I'm gonna let my agent do that and I'm going to control what I can control. Mm -hmm. And it's working out, it's playing, it's doing the best I can. And, you know, so often too, across the, across really all of sports and just kind of life too, oftentimes you just can't control like becoming the starter and and you may even feel like you're better or you may be playing better but for different reasons coaches feel comfortable with different players and and so yep. there, there really is there's just a lot out of your control and and we know that even coaches think they're they're uh, we always call them control freaks and and especially college coaches they try to control everything but the reality is so much is out of their control they can't control all these players and what the players do at three in the morning on a thursday night and all these different things and so the mentality of, all right, I'm just going to control what I can control. It's so it's, it's true, but often we, but we fight against that players mm -hmm. fight against it. Coaches fight against it. And we do that in our own life because we all want to control everything. Mm -hmm. We want, we want to think that we're more in control than we are. And the sooner we're willing to get to this point of, all right, I'm just going to control what I can control and acknowledge and admit and accept. There's a lot out of my control. And, and, be, and in some ways, being okay with that. Um, and so for us, in, in our own lives, we, 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 we'll look at this from a, a biblical perspective and, and as followers of Jesus, uh, but we look at sort of life situations, circumstances, you know, job situations. You know, we, we wish our kids would make the right choices all the time, but we can't control it. We can control, you know, a lot of the ways of how we raise them and encouragement and, and sharing wisdom with them and putting them in good spots, but ultimately our kids have to make decisions on their own too. And mm -hmm. so that's an example. You know, health issues are so out of our control. Car accidents are out of our control for the most part. Um, you know, all these other challenges that we face, we're just reminded daily that we can't control everything as much as we, we really want to. And we definitely can't control other people either. So yeah, that's I, the daily battle for all of us. But the reality is we love feeling like we're in control. <laughs> I was reading one commentary and they were talking about all the little ways that we feel like we're in control. That feels amazing. The thermostat in the house, ah. <laughs> boy, does it feel good to be able to control that? Turn it down a couple notches, turn it up a couple notches for, uh, for the lawn care people in the world for you, when you are done mowing your lawn and it looks how you like it to look, I'm sure that feels incredible. However, I can't control that grass growing. <laughs> I can't, I, I can only do so much. I can do some fertilizer. I can give it some water, yeah. but I can't make it grow. And the neighbor's really lawn can't. still looks better. It still looks better. <laughs> Cameron's got a great but lawn. But it's true. We, we love to be in control or at least give ourselves the feeling, the illusion of control in little ways. We love it in our day-to-day -day mm -hmm. lives. And we probably do it in more ways than we think because we're just constantly pursuing this illusion of control as a means of comfort. And we're going to unpack this more, but it, it's a reality for all of us. We all love the illusion of control. We, we do. And so what I, what the direction that we want to go to today is what can we actually control? And so, you know, we have to get to that point of, especially as followers of Jesus, where we say, you know what? I understand that God is ultimately in control and he's good. He's faithful. We, we trust in, in, in his power and we surrender to his will and his purposes. And, you know, we just, we just live this open-handed, open-hearted, open-minded type of, you know, life. We try to get to that, right? It's hard. This is, hard. This is the battle that we go through, but that's, that's the, the right posture that we want to have. And then we say, you know what, I'm going to focus on what I can control. And so every day, there's so much out of our control. So we focus on what we can control. And, and so what is it? I actually think there are a number of things that we can control. And so we'll focus on four of those things today. 
And, and so, of course, we want to you know, continue to go to God's word and, and understand, okay, what is God asking me to do? What has he revealed? What, what aspects of his will and his purposes has he revealed in his word? And so we continue to go back to that. Um, and then we, we obey and we, we control what we can control. We take action as we're able to take action. Now, all of these things that we talk about, in the, and we talk about this almost every show, Anything that we do, we want to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. So mm-hmm. we talked about you know, last week, we're, we're, we're strong when we're weak because we're relying on, on his strength, God's strength, not our own. And so we always want to rely on the po- power of the Holy Spirit. But we do have, have the control to, to take action and, and to, to, to do certain things. So here are the things. First thing, we can control our trust. Mm-hmm. Are we going to trust? And so I'll let you jump in, Luke. But the, the trust is really the, 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 the foundation for, okay, what, what can we control? We make the choice every day. Am I going to trust? Am I going to trust that God is in control? And then am I going to trust him in all the different situations and the circumstances that, that I find myself in? Yeah, I have a couple things that I, I want to share about this because the trust is important, but we don't have blind trust. And I think in any conversation about faith, as we parallel sports to faith, we really have to bring in time and time again the truth of the gospel. Because a lot of a lot of this desire for control is out of a distrust for God. Either we don't believe he's in control, or we do believe he's in control, but we doubt his goodness towards us, his good plans. Because there's many times where things are happening and it feels like, surely there's no plan here. What direction could this possibly be going that's for my good? Mm. How on earth could this work out? So we either trust God's power or we trust, or, or we either doubt God's power or we doubt his goodness. Mm. So we have to come back to the truth of the gospel. And in order to to relinquish this desire for control, we must trust God. How do we trust God? We know that Jesus, who is God, died for us in our place. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and that we have right relationship with God because the Father sent his Son to die for us, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we've been made sons and daughters. If he did that and willed that, we can trust his power, Jesus rose from the dead, we can trust his power, and he did that on our behalf, we can trust his goodness. So out of this foundation, now we can trust God who is in control, and we can relinquish some control, but it must be rooted in an outflow of believing the gospel. That leads us to trusting God, not this, oh, you should trust God. Well, yes, but why? Mm. We know because he has the truth of the gospel is this amazing reality. We can trust him. Mm. Amen. And, and, and yes, yeah, so we, we can control whether we trust him or, or not. And to your point, we've got great reason to trust him. There's, there's no doubt about it. And so uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in the Amplified, it tells us, trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your path straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. And so that's the opportunity that we have, to trust him. And and so when everything else feels out of control, we can trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all our heart. And and so along with that, secondly, um, we're able to commit whatever we're doing to the Lord. And then we respond by following his guidance. And so we can we, we control whether or not we're going to commit what we're doing to the Lord and we're going to follow his guidance. And so Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your works to the Lord, submit and trust them to him, and your plans will succeed if you respond to his will and guidance. And so, you know, succeed, that, that's, a, that's a buzzword. Um, and so we can, get, we can get caught up in that. But, but ultimately, we want to succeed in doing God's will, yeah. being committed to living and, and focusing on 
committing our, our, our efforts, our work to the Lord for his honor, for his glory, in service to him. And so we can control whether, whether we're going to be motivated by worldly success or you know, success in the, in the sight of God and, and, and ultimately what we're getting on board with his purposes, his will, and what he wants to accomplish through us and in us. And so do we trust him in that? And so, again, we, we control whether we, we trust in that and we commit what we're doing to him. Say, God, I'm, I'm yours. I'm, I'm committed to you. And what, what I do, I want to do it for you and with you by your power. And, and, and that's, that's what we can control today. And when we do commit our works to God, that's, that's an element of, of worshiping him on everything I'm doing is to the glory of God. And when we are worshiping God, we are similar to last week's episode, coming to the end of ourself. And then when we're worshiping him, we're trusting that I don't have control, but I am in fellowship with the one who really is in control. Sure. And as I'm committing my works to him, there's this, this overflow of worship. My mind and my heart is set on him. And now when I'm doing that, as I'm committing my works to him, I'm trusting him more and I'm acknowledging that now, he really is in control because everything I'm doing is to honor and glorify him because, and now that, that fellowship with him is continuing to build this confidence that he really is in control. Rather than committing our works to ourselves and our own purposes, that means we're grasping at control. Mm. But when we're committing our works to him, we're worshiping him, and then, then this, this trust in God's control continues to grow. We're submitting. We're submitting to his his leading and guiding, and and oftentimes he'll he'll reveal one step, the next step, and and that's that's what we can do. And so again, we we could control what we can control. We control taking the next step that he's revealed to us, mm -hmm. and then we have to trust, and and we have to continue to submit and say, God, what's next? What what, what do you want me to, until you tell me to go? I'm I'm trusting in in you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm committed to, to going your way. I'm, I'm submitted to your plan and your will. And, and yep. you know, help me to trust as, as I, as I, I uh, wait. I've, I've heard this, this analogy of, and it's not true all the time. You know, sometimes God does let you know the big picture, the next five and the next 10 steps. Certainly he does that. But he also, uh, tell, the, the next step is all he reveals. And it's, do we trust him? to take that step. Yeah. And, and the analogy is, you know, we're in a cave basically, and it's not, we have uh, a flashlight looking a hundred yards ahead. It's, we have a little lantern that gives us a little light around our feet enough to take a next step. And that's yep. uh, often how God guides us is here's the next step. It's time to take it. Trust me with the outcome because I am all powerful and I'm all good and I'm worthy to be trusted. We control what we can control. And so it's, it's, it's trust. It's taking the, the next step and, and it's, it's committing, it's committing our, our life, our work works, everything we do, everything we, you know, everything we are to him. So we, we control whether or not we commit it to him or to ourselves. Um, and so, and then the third thing, when, when we've got a heart that's been changed by Jesus, we can control our gratitude and thankfulness. And, and even in a bigger picture, like we also just control our attitude. And, and so my dad used to always say, that, that's the thing that you can control. You can control your attitude. You can't control what everybody else is going to do, but you can control your attitude. And that stuck with me. And, and specifically today, I want to focus on just this concept of gratitude and thankfulness. And, and I continue to bring up gratitude. It's, it's my word of the year that, that God put on my heart. Um, and, and so first Thessalonians 518. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And so when we, when we control our thankfulness and, and, and our gratitude, it, it frees us up in so many ways. It, it gives us the right perspective. Instead of getting, you know, it's like you get worried and frustrated by all the things we can't control. Mm -hmm. But if we have a heart of gratitude, it's like, oh, man, all right, God's, God's got me. Mm -hmm. Like, look at all the things he's done. Look, look at who he is. I'm thankful for that. The, back to the gospel. 
we're thankful for for him saving us. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, all right, all these things I can't control, all these things that are disappointing and frustrating, and I want this, I want that. No, 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 no. God, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for all these wonderful blessings that I have in my life. And, and it, 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 it changes things for us. No question. Gratitude is... Uh, when my, my youth pastor in college, who I served under, uh, harped on this quite a bit, is gratitude is underutilized by Christians as a spiritual discipline. Its impact is is tremendous. There's one quote from uh, an Enduring Word commentary. It says, uh, We don't give thanks for everything, but in everything. We recognize God's sovereign hand is in charge and not blind fate or chance. Mm. There's always time to express gratitude for God. And specifically in the, in the day-to-day, it allows us to continue to trust, to continue to relinquish control, to grow in love for God, our affections for God. And practically, for example, you know, sin tastes more bitter when we're expressing gratitude for the pure things of God. When we are continuing to be overwhelmed with real gratitude for the things of God, for life change, for his good gifts, sin tastes bitter. It tastes mm. worse when we when we pursue it, when we fall into it. It's because we have gratitude for good things. Hardships become more easily able to endure because we have genuine gratitude for God's provision, his meeting of our needs, again, the gospel, the reality of that. Because the the core here is gratitude lifts our eyes up off of ourselves. Mm. And grasping control is an inward reality. It's eyes on ourselves. It's eyes on the world uh, that our desires and plans in this world is the end goal of everything. It's an eyes down mentality, but gratitude forces our eyes up on God and gets, uh, gets I mean, again, to the end of ourself. No, my desire for control, my plans... They don't matter as much compared to God's plans, nor do I even have the control to pursue my own plans. Mm. We have to get our eyes up on God, and gratitude is a key way to do that. We have a choice. We have a choice to, to be thankful, to show gratitude, and to your point, to lift our eyes. We, we're in control of that. Are we going to do it? Are we going to daily make that a part of our, our routine and the discipline? Like you mentioned, Luke, I think that's, that's, that's key. That's a great spiritual discipline. There's no, no doubt about it. Um, and so, uh, first three things we talked about trust, we can control our trust Two, the, the, the commitment, uh, our committing everything we do to God and doing it for his glory, for his honor, for his service, uh, choosing and, and the controlling our gratitude and thankfulness. And then lastly, again, by the power of the Holy spirit, we can choose to humble ourselves and and this to me really is 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 such a posture of surrender, submission, acknowledgement of of God's almighty goodness, power, uh, His might, and and acknowledging, man, I'm I'm so small. <laughs> I'm, like we talked about last week, I'm so weak and broken in need of you. Um, and so we humble ourselves. And so James four ten says, humble yourselves with an attitude of repentance and insignificance in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will give you purpose. And so, but we have to humble ourselves and submit and say, all right, God, I, I'm, I'm yours. I, I'm nothing without you. And I'm, I'm weak. I need you. Um, and you are, you are good. You are powerful. Um, you are the one worthy to be praised. You are in control. I'm not in control. That's mm -hmm. the humility of it. It's amazing the pride of people that we all deal with where we think we're in control. Mm -hmm. Like to your point, the illusion of control, yeah. how arrogant and prideful that we think we're, we're in control of all these different things. And we, we, we chase after that. No, it's, it's in humility. <sighs> I'm not in control and that's okay because God, you are. And so guide me, show me, mm -hmm. give me the strength I need. Yeah. We, we don't, we don't have control. And I mean, the reality is, we have we can have self control, and even that is a gift of the spirit. 
That's right. We need the spirit for that. Everything that we think we control, we don't. It ultimately, God is in control. Amen. Psalm 25, 9. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. And so if we want to know, you know, what's right and, and, and just allow him to, to lead us and guide us and show us the right way in, in life and to make the, you know, the right obedient decisions, uh, we got to humble ourselves. We got to humble ourselves. And we, we control that. We control that, that, that act of, of humbling and, you know, asking him to increase and us to decrease and, and putting him in right standing and, and us having that right posture versus that, that puffed out prideful, you know, selfish, arrogant mentality. It's that, it's that, that humility that, that we, we love seeing in other people. It's, it's evident when you see it in other people. And, and so we can choose and, and, and take those steps toward, toward humbling ourselves. Um, and the more we dive into God's word and understand who he is and, and who we are and our need for him, that, that, that humbling process uh, takes place. Um, and so for us today, as we you know, think back to kind of Malik Willis talking about him focusing on what he can control, um, you know, same, same thing for us. We, we, can, we can be discouraged, frustrated, worried uh, by the things that are out of our control and you know, worried about our future and, and all, all of these negative feelings and emotions. But, but instead, let's experience peace and joy as we focus on controlling what we can control, our trust, our gratitude, our humility, and our willingness to commit everything to God. And so that's the encouragement today. I, I, I wrote this devotional yesterday, and it, it was you know, God speaking to me. Um, I'm wrestling right now. I, I've got some some major challenges weighing on me that, that I'm, 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 you know, wanting to control things and frustrated sometimes that I can't control things. And I'm, I'm having to continue to go back to these things. Am I going to trust them? Am I going to choose to trust them? Am I going to humble myself? And am I going to commit everything I am and everything I do to him? And so those are, those are the, the choices that we, we have today. So uh, hopefully that's encouraging that, that, we acknowledge, all right, uh, yeah, I'm not in control of everything, and that's okay. But here's what I can control mm -hmm. and focus in on that. And, all right, Luke, and last word from you. And it's day-to-day, -to -day too. It's not this, all right, starting today, I believe God is in control, and I do not pursue control in my own life. It's This is a sometimes hourly decision Yeah. Um, because it is— it is difficult, but thankfully in God's grace and by the power of His Spirit, He— he helps us lift our eyes off of ourselves, and and it's a it's a mercy from him to help us for him to cause us to realize how little control we do have, because mm. then we really become united with him who is in control. Because just think about it, if we really were in control, oh, disaster. Uh, yeah. So let let let's uh yeah let let let's be uh, let's be okay with it and uh, stop pretending like we we know what we know what's best and and all that. Um, yeah. And then also, yeah, I mean, we live just the way the life life is. We we can't control everything and everyone, um, and so we choose whether or not we're going to be, you know, discouraged, worried, frustrated. Um, you know, when we're the third string quarterback, how, how are we going to respond when that's the case? And yep. so that's that's our that's our choice. So we just keep showing up. We take one step at a time, one day at a time, with the Lord, relying on Him, surrender, submission. Talk about it all the time. I got to tell myself every day. That's that's what it is. So I hope that that's encouraging to you as a listener today. Uh, Luke, as always, great insight. We appreciate you. Uh, enjoy the, the rest of your week. And thanks, everybody, for listening today. It's been the Unpacking It podcast. I'm Bryce. I'm a sports fan who follows Jesus. I believe in the good news that he died on the cross for my sin. He was resurrected. And through faith, I've been saved by his grace. I hope that is true for you as well. And I hope you'll join me as we live life as sports fans follow Jesus together. Have a great rest of your day. I encourage you to share this podcast with somebody. Send it along. Great review. Greatly appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time right here on the Unpacking It podcast. Mm -hmm.